probably all of you do remember this that, this event. So it was was quite severe, and I think all of you have these pictures in mind. And here we we see one of them. We can see what severe impact this event had, and I'm sure that's also the reason that I'm here today because it it really was one of the largest events affecting Germany recently. And with that, I'm coming to the motivation for this study. So it was in July last year, July 2021, that a cutoff low pressure system called Berndt led to quite severe flooding in Germany and the Benelux countries. The event led to really quite severe impacts and there were more than 200 fatalities and quite severe damage to infrastructure, such as, for example, railway line and roads and houses, of course. Um, and the German Insurance Association estimated the damages to be 4.5 to 5.5 billion shortly after the event. So I think that that estimate might have gone up since then, um, as you know, more and more damages uh, yeah, were found. Um, and actually quite shortly after the event, so within days of the event, World Weather Attribution initiated an attribution study, which was led by Frank Kreienkamp. And the study was then published on 23rd August, 2021. So we managed to publish in just a bit more than one month. And that's quite important for these attribution studies because of course the interest is highest within, you know, the time span where media is still interested in the event, that's when, when it really gets picked up. And so for this extreme event, it was still good to publish within a bit more than a month. There was still a lot of interest. Now, if we look a little bit into the event, so into the rainfall, could you tell me if you see my mouse? Yes, because yeah, we can good. see it. Yes. Good. So we have uh, here on the left-hand side, 48 hour precipitation sums of the event. And we can see that in some area, the precipitation reached more than 175 millimeters accumulated over two days. And then if we look into the precipitation sums for always 24 hours, we can see that uh, within yeah, yeah, Belgium and the Benelux region, we already had a lot of rainfall on the first day and then the worst affected areas in Germany had their main precipitation amounts really just on one day. So you could speak in the Benelux countries maybe more about um, a two-day rainfall event and in the worst affected areas in Germany. It really happened mostly in one day, so more of one-day events that, that we analyzed there. Now I would like to say a couple of words about the hydrological characteristics. Um, of this event. However, the real attribution part that, that we then proceed to will be done on rainfall characteristics. Um, and I will explain a little bit why that is the case. So yes, yeah, as, as we all know, we had quite severe flooding uh, that was caused by the rainfall. And some of the rivers that, that were most affected are quite prone to flooding. So, while this event had the highest observed water levels, there are some historical flood, ma flood marks that indicate similar flood heights. For example, there was a flood of the R River in 1904. However, I should note that there's no indication of past floods affecting as many catchments as this event from last year did. So there are flood marks from 1804 in the R Valley, but not also in the neighboring valley. So it seems to have been more localized. And then of course, also the impacts are more localized. And if, if one valley has damages, but the neighboring valleys are still unimpacted or not severely impacted, of course, it, it's a little bit easier um, to also repair the damages if it's not such a huge region. And if we now look at some water levels of the event, so we see here the water levels of several catchments, uh, the measurements over the, the mid of, of June, or sorry, of July, uh, so 12th to 18th of July, and we see in blue the water level, and then we do see a red dashed line for the maximum observed water level from the past. And here for the, uh, 
Eisten catchment of, of the Murrays. This red line is actually something else. It's an extreme scenario for flood management. And we can see that in all of the catchments, the maximum values observed to date or this um, estimate of a maximum scenario, extreme scenario, were overtopped. So we had more, a higher level of flooding than, than was expected uh, from past observations. And what we also see here in the Vestra catchment and in the R is that some of the instruments were actually destroyed. So that was another problem caused by the event. It was so severe and you would have all seen the pictures of, of debris coming down the rivers. And I mean, debris in some cases were cars and yeah, some of the uh, ob observing equipment was actually as severely damaged that it didn't provide any measurements anymore. And therefore, yeah, we see here that, that there's just this area where we don't have, have any measurements and can't really say what the absolute maximum value has been. So now I will proceed with a short introduction of world weather attribution. But I think you do all know a little bit about it, specifically if you have joined the whole uh, Proclias Easy Map webinar series, because Freddie Otto did already talk about world weather attribution. So just a couple of words here. World weather attribution was established in 2015 and it was done to conduct attribution analysis just after an extreme event happened. So really in the time span of the interest of the public and media. So it's not so much for the benefit of just scientists, for the, but for the benefit of the wider public. And the idea was to provide scientifically robust information about the influence of climate change on specific extreme events and yeah, as I said, to the media, public, and also decision makers, which may also not always read our scientific literature that becomes available quite a bit after the event. The World Weather Attribution Studies are based on peer-reviewed methods and are then published on worldweatherattribution.org within a couple of weeks following the event. If an attribution study involves new aspects that are not yet peer reviewed, then the study will go through peer review following the, the publication on world weather attribution. And that's actually something that we are currently working on for this study that I'm presenting to you today. And here, this is a screenshot that I took um, from the Times list of the 100 100 most influential people of 2021. And we can see here that Freddie Otto and Gerd Jan von Oldenburg were honored to be in that list for their work on establishing and running world weather attribution. So clearly this initiative has a lot of impact by now and has done quite a lot of studies. And, and you, if you are interested, you can find them on the website. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with with some of these studies. Um, so I think this is a great initiative and we can be very glad that Freddie and Gerd Jan initiated this. Now I will say also just a couple of words about extreme event attribution in general, because I think most of you know a lot about it. So extreme event attribution evaluates the impact of human-made climate change on specific extreme weather events. And the questions that are addressed are, for example, has climate change increased the likelihood of such an event? And has climate change made this event more severe, more, more strong? Um, and in quite general, the approach to attribution studies is to compare extreme events in the current climate and in a climate with no or little human impact. So you can imagine this as we simulate the world as we know it, the world where we have planes, we have trains, we have factories, we have cars, everything that we have at the moment. And we simulate the world that has everything that it would have without us. So volcanoes are there, trees are there, everything is there, but there are no cars, planes, factories uh, that we have built and with which we do change the, the um the climate. And I will now say a couple of words about this specific method for world weather attribution studies. So 
here the observational data as well as climate model simulations are used to calculate an extreme index. For example, we could calculate the highest daily rainfall amount over Germany per year. So kind of a block maxima for the one year. So in every year we have then, then the highest amount of rainfall. Um, we can then fit a distribution to these data and we can assume the dependence on a covariate. So what is most often used in world weather attribution is the global mean surface temperature, the GMST as a covariate. Um, and this covariate changes over time due to anthropogenic climate change. And we can then use the dependence on this covariate to analyze the change in frequency and severity. Um, and this methodology is, is described in more detail in Philip et al. and Van Oldenburg et al. And I will give you the citations later. Now let me just show you a couple of equations for one example of a generalized extreme value distribution of rainfall. So we have here the general equation for a GV distribution where X is the evaluated variable. So here, for example, now this highest daily rainfall amount per year. Then we have the location scale and shape parameter. And we now assume that the location and the scale parameter co-vary with the global mean surface temperature anomaly. And we can see the equation for, for this here. And we now have mu zero and sigma zero as the location and scale parameter in a current climate when the global mean surface temperature anomaly is, is equal to zero. Um, so that's just a quick example that, that you can imagine this in equations as well. Now I would like to move over to the definition of the July 2020 extreme rainfall event. So the definition of the event is really essential for any attribution study. Uh, this is one of the first steps. I mean, you first look a little bit into the observations, how the event played out, and then you come to the definition of the event, and that's a really essential part. Um, based on the impact that we saw of this event, for this study, we selected the R Erft and the Moist catchment. However, we found that these areas are really quite small for an attribution study and therefore extended the analysis using the pooling approach to 14 subregions of Europe. And we now see these regions that we analyzed here. So we have in black the combined R and Erft catchment. We have here in, in red the Moist catchment. And then we do have these 14 tiles that together built the pooling region. We then chose to analyze the summer half year precipitation events. So we only look into the summer because rainfall events in, in this region are a little bit different from their characteristics in summer or winter. And we do want to concentrate on events that are let's say somewhat similar, so not to mix these summer events with let's say severe winter storms springing precipitation. And we do look into the maximum one day and two day rainfall accumulation. So as I've told you, we can use these block maxima and here we use block maxima for one day and for two day rainfall accumulations. But the results that I will show you will just be for the pooling region and for one day event, just to keep this a little bit concise. Um, as we have seen at the very beginning, the characteristics were a little bit different. So we analyzed for R and R, we looked into a one day rainfall event because most of the rain fell in just one day. And for the most, we looked into a two day rainfall event. And then for the pooling region, we really looked into a one day and a two day rainfall event and got quite similar results. Now I would like to point out some specific aspects in the methodology. So the one specific thing was really the pooling approach. So we used the data from these individual tiles of the pooling region and combined them into one long time series to increase the data availability. So this is somewhat of a statistical trick to achieve robust results. Um, then, so that there were 
based on the scale of, of this event, uh, we decided to only use models with at least a resolution of 12.5 kilometers, not any coarser. And we also tried to use some convection permitting models because the event had some con convective uh, characteristics. And so we, we started with 12.5 kilometers, but some are quite a bit uh, smaller resolution. Uh, the shortcoming with the convection resolution models is that they typically have just one, uh, one ensemble member and they are a bit shorter. So we couldn't just use convection permitting models. Uh, maybe there will be a day in future where we have a lot more data, but they are very computationally expensive. And because we had these new aspects, and it was actually quite, quite a challenging study to get yeah, all of these together on the scale that the event happened at, we are now working on a peer-reviewed publication to actually really present these, these new, uh, or I mean, some of these things have been used, so pooling approaches have been used in the past, but yeah, we want to make sure that this goes through the peer review now. And then just to say we did then analyze differences from past to present so from a pre-industrial climate that is minus 1.2 degrees colder relative to 2021 and analyze the difference there and then we also look into a present to future comparison where we have 0 0.8 degrees uh, of of rise in the global mean surface temperature above the climate from 2021. Now I will proceed with the observational analysis for our aft and the, the MERS catchment. Um, so let's first look into the our aft region. So we see here the block maxima of one day rainfall. Uh, so one value per year, one maximum value per year. And we have then here at the very end the value of 2021. And we can directly see that this value was more than 90 million millimeters per day averaged over the whole region has been unprecedented. So we haven't seen in the observational record starting 1930, we haven't seen uh, such an event before. I should note that these 93 millimeters per day, that's really averaged over these two catchments of R and F. So locally, the rainfall was a lot higher than 90 millimeters per day. Now, if we look into this Belgian part of the Meuse catchment, then what we see here, this is now again a uh, millimeter per day, but we have the, the block maxima of two day rainfall. So we have here about 55 millimeters per day, but that means of course over 100 millimeters within the two days. Um, and we can again here see that in the observational record, for this data set, it starts around 1950. The event has actually been unprecedented and we, we do see more rainfall averaged over the area than, than we have observed in the past. And so because we now have rainfall that exceeds any event in the past, it's actually quite challenging to estimate return periods. And we then have quite a high uncertainty if we estimate return periods. And furthermore, the large internal variability prohibits the detection of a trend on these small scales. And that's actually, so that's also expected. So we did give a little bit more of an explanation in, in the study. So it, it is somewhat expected that the internal variability is larger than the signal uh, at the current time. And this is why we decided to actually use the pooling approach to increase the robustness of the attribution results. And I will now show you the observational analysis for the pooling region. So what we see here now is a similar plot. However, we have per year always 14 values that you can see in the little lines there. Um, and we have an event of one day. So Rx one day is what we call this maximum one day rainfall amount of the year. And now we can see here is the event a little bit over 60 millimeters uh, per, per day. And we can see that now actually looking at all these regions that 
similar events have been observed in the past. So it's, it's not so far out of the range if we look at these larger regions. And we can now go on to detect the climate change signal in this data set. And what we do, we have here sufficient data available and we therefore use five-year block maxima. So we actually look further into the tail of the distribution um, to really just take the, the absolutely most extreme values. And we can see that these block maxima actually show a trend with global mean surface temperature. So we can see here that at colder temperatures, the, the rainfall seem to be a little bit lower than at warmer temperatures. So we, we see here um, a signal. And here in the very top corner in a square, we see the event um, that, that we analyze here. So it was still, still yeah, one of the highest events as we have seen before, and we could detect a trend here. Now, in the next step, we go over to fitting a distribution and estimating the anthropogenic signal that we can see for this event. So we now use the data from these 14 subregions and uh, do a generalized extreme value GV fit, um, as I have shown before. And let me quickly explain this plot to you. So we have here on the x-axis the return period in year, and we have here the this is again this Rx1 day, so the, the most extreme value in a year in millimeters per day. We see in, in this magenta line that's the size of the event that we are analyzing here. Then if we look at these little red plus signs, that are the observations. Um, that we have of this variable and the line that is fitted through, that's, that's really the GV fit uh, through the red dots. And now if we can use this covariate, the global mean surface temperature to scale the GV, the GV fit to a colder climate condition. And that's what we can see here now in the blue dots. So we, we scaled it uh, down with the global mean surface temperature normally and see how, how different these return periods would have looked in a colder climate. Um, and in, in this case, we do actually see a clear distinction between the GV fit under current and pre-industrial conditions. So these really do not lie above each other, um, but you can see this clear distinction. And I will now show you in a different plot, a little bit more general, how we use that to estimate the change in return period and severity. So this is now actually an example of, of temperature that I, I have once made to just yeah, show the concept a little bit. Uh, so I know it's a different variable here, but the concept is the same. So if we want to see how, how the frequency has, of such an event has changed, we look into the probability ratio. So the difference in probability uh, of the event in pre-industrial and current time. And we do that by taking the, the probability in the factual scenario. So in the world that we live in, that's the factual scenario and divided by the probability in the counterfactual scenario. If now the probability ratio is above one, then the event became more likely through anthropogenic climate change. If it's below one, the event be, uh, yeah below one, the event became less likely through anthropogenic climate change. And of course, that can also happen, for example, for cold cold waves, cold outbreaks. Then we do want to estimate the intensity intensity change. And if we look into temperature and calculate this in Kelvin or degree Celsius we can build the difference between the factual, the temperature and the world we live in now and the, the world, the pre-industrial counterfactual world. If you want to calculate the intensity change for rainfall, we want to get a percentage change. And here we look into the rainfall in the factual scenario minus the rainfall in the counterfactual scenario divided by the counterfactual rainfall and take this times 100 to get the percentage change. And if we now want to look at this in the figure, so we have similarly to what we have seen before in, in red here, 
the line of an hypothetic event that I have selected here, 29 degrees. Um, and we have the factual scenario in blue and the counterfactual in orange. And if we now zoom in here and go along the horizontal line, then we can see that we had a change in return time of 22 years. And our probability ratio was that the probability in the factual scenario was once in 26 years that we had such an event. We divide that in the counterfactual uh, probability of one in 48 years that we had such an event and get a probability ratio of 1.85. If we want to have the change in intensity, then we go along the vertical line here. There's my mouse. And we can, in this case, it's, it's a temperature difference. So it's a, it's a simple difference. And we see that the change in intensity was 0 0.8 degrees Celsius. And that's kind of by going along the vertical and, and vertical and horizontal, this is how we can, can estimate change in, in in frequency and severity. Now let's move on to the estimation of the return periods and the observation-based attribution. And I will tell you a little bit about the results that we found here. So within the larger Western European region, so the pooling region, we can expect on average one such event every 400 years for a given location within this larger region. So what does that mean? So it means specifically that we can expect more than one such event to occur within 400 years in the entire larger Western European region. Um, so this is something that I think was quite hard to understand in the study uh, for people that might not work in the field that it's not once in 400 years in the entire region, but, but once in 400 years at a given location. We then looked into the observational results where we used the EOPS data set, and this indicates a probability ratio between 2 and 52 and an intensity change between 6.7 and 34%. And now in the next step, we actually use the models. We first validate them and then estimate the change in frequency and intensity using, using, using the models based on the same method that I have just showed you what we did with the observations. And then we synthesized the results of the, of the observations and the model analysis in one consistent attribution statement. And yeah, we will now look into these different results of the observations and of the climate model simulations, and then also into the synthesis of the results. So we now here, I mean, many of you might have seen these plots before. These are the typical synthesis plots for world weather attribution studies. And we see now here the change in intensity and in percent. And we will in a moment also see the probability ratios. So here, I mean, here's 0%. So no change is this little um, vertical line that we see here. At the very top in blue, we see the observations. I have already given you the numbers for this. So the observational anal analysis has a best estimate a little bit more than 20% um, of change here. And then we do look into the different uh, climate models. And we can see here how many ensemble members there were. So Eurocordex has actually several, several different models in it. We have these convection resolving models that always have just one member. And then we have a, a, a Dutch uh, model called RACMO, which had seven, 16 members. And we see the different results for these. And then the different models are synthesized. And then in the synthesis here in, in Magenta, we combine the model results and the observational results. And we can see here that there's actually quite a large error bar, um, which is because the, the observational analysis actually gives us quite a little bit a higher estimate than the analysis of, of the climate model simulations. So that's, that's one of the things we see here. But also what I should point out, we see quite, quite a clear signal that actually the intensity increased. So, so we get quite a robust result. However, with a large 
uncertainty around it. Um, now I would like to come to the probability ratio. So a very similar plot. However, we now see the, those probability ratios. We have here the vertical line at one. So as I told you earlier, values above one uh, say the probability has increased because of anthropogenic climate change. Below one means the probability has decreased with anthropogenic climate change. We can again similarly see that the observations actually provide the highest estimate, but when we synthesize the observations and the models, we see quite a robust increase of the probability. So we, we see also here a clear, uh, a clear result that the event became more, more likely uh, or more frequent through anthropogenic climate change. And with that, I would like to come to the summary of the results. Um, so the main impact of, of the, this event was actually caused by flooding of, of the rivers in Germany and, and the Benelux, the neighboring Benelux countries. Um, the rainfall that, that led to this severe flooding, especially around the German rivers are and Erft, so that were the more, most severely affected regions. Uh, flooding at the R was only comparable to the most severe historical records, um, which were indicated by these flood marks. So these are really marks on walls that say how high the water stood in the past. So these are pre the observational records, so we don't have any rainfall estimates from these times. And there was, for example, this one small scale event in summer 1804 that impacted the R catchment, but not the neighboring catchment as it was the case this time. And I would now like to use the words of my colleague and co-author Enno Nielsen uh, to describe how severe this, or yeah, how the rainfall amounts looked. And he said, this means that for a brief moment, a volume of water flowed through the R Valley that corresponds to the mean discharge of the Upper Rhine. And I, I think that, I mean, it's, it's quite a nice description of what happened there. I mean, you have seen these pictures of the R Valley. It's not a huge river. So you can imagine that if such an event happens, it will have severe impacts. And that's what we actually saw here. However, although the most severe impacts were caused through the flooding of the rivers, the availability of hydrological data did not allow an hydrological attribution. And we thus concentrated on the rainfall itself, which caused these high, uh, high amounts of flooding, high water levels. So that's, I think, probably in future, there will also be more and more hydrological attribution studies, but at the current stage, we were only able to, to attribute the rainfall itself. And I think that was also already a big success. Now some more summary of the results. So the observed rainfall amounts in the R and Erft, as well as the Belgian part of the Meuse catchment broke historically observed rainfall records if you, as you have seen in the plots earlier. However, in regions of this size, the robust estimation of return values and also the detection and attribution of trends is, is quite challenging. And if you have read the report, you will see that we actually did all the steps for these two catchments as well, but it wasn't possible to estimate the return values very well. And the results are just not the most robust. We do see a tendency to more severe and more um, frequent events. But we then actually decided to use this pooling approach to increase the robustness. And um, yeah, we could then show a robust signal towards an increased likelihood and an increased severity of such events. So in the current climate for a given location within this larger region, we can on average expect one such event every 400 years. Um, and we could show that climate change increased the intensity of the one day event in the summer season in this larger region by three to 19%. So while this is a 
quite a range. It is still quite a robust result. It's a clear increase in the intensity. We could also show that the likelihood of such an event to occur today in comparison to a climate that's 1.2 degrees colder has increased by a factor between 1.2 and 9 for the one day event. And actually the results are quite similar for the two day event. So again, there is a clear and robust increase in the frequency of such events, but with a wide range about that. And of course, research is, is progressing to decrease the range that we see here. Um, yeah, as I said, we have done the same analysis for the two-day event with similar results. And we also looked into what happens in a future scenario. And what we could see there is that also there, the, the frequency and severity of this event will further increase in future. And with that, I would like to just show you the literature. So first of all, the, the world weather attribution study that I presented here and you can also yeah, keep your eyes open for the peer-reviewed study which will come out in due course and then also some further literature for you here and with that I would like to finish my presentation and we can move over to actually yeah, answering your question.